Wait, so you're telling me not only do I have to take 19 units, I have to find time for my extracurricular activities, like clinical volunteering and shadowing. That's not all. I have to earn the highest GPA possible and do well on this monster of an exam for the MCAT? Wait, there's more? I have to build strong relationships with my letter of recommendation writers? All in four years? Are you sure? And I'm also supposed to have a social life, take care of my mind and body, and have time to go back to the family during the holidays? Are you sure? I just turned 18. I just started my freshman year. This pre-med stuff can't be that hard, right? <laughs> All right, well, end scene, and you can tell why I'm not an actor full time. Unfortunately, what I said above is the reality, but I do promise you'll be able to do all of that and more. One major win to accomplishing all of that is to dial in how you study. And today, I'll tell you all the science-backed tips and fundamentals of studying that I wish I knew when I was in college. Let me be clear, I'm gonna make a bold statement here. If you master these fundamentals, it will literally be all that you need to get the grades that you want. And what's more, I'm not done. You'll get the grades that you want in less time than you currently study. It sounds too good to be true, but here's a catch. It's a lot harder to study the right way. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Michael. I'm a UCLA medical student. And in this corner of the internet, we figure out ways to live happier, more fulfilling pre-med lives. Today, I'll teach you how to most optimally study, but please, don't let this be another video on the internet that you just watch and do nothing about. Please spend time integrating and putting those things into your own study habits and techniques. If you have any questions or just want to chat, please feel free to leave a comment down below or find me on Instagram here and send me a message there. Let's get started. Fundamental number one, active versus passive learning. This is a concept harped on in every study video on the internet and for good reason. It's one of the most important fundamentals that you can get right. Passive learning feels easy, it's very comfortable, and unfortunately, it's extremely ineffective. Examples include reading and highlighting your notes, watching your lectures and videos, or rereading your lecture slides. Active learning, on the other hand, feels hard. It's not very comfortable, but it's extremely effective. Examples include doing practice problems, creating your own notes and flashcards instead of pulling them from the internet, and overall, it should feel genuinely mentally taxing. Now, of course, it's impossible to only do active learning. There's going to be times where you have to passively learn. You have to go to your lecture and passively listen to your lecturer. You have to open the textbook and passively read the textbook. But otherwise, when there are opportunities to choose between passive or active learning, choose active. It may be harder now, but you'll save plenty of time in the long run and you'll learn the material much better. Other than the examples I gave above, one way to determine if you're passively or actively learning is honestly by how it feels. I'll give you an example outside of studying. I work in a program that helps patients at risk for chronic diseases like hypertension and high cholesterol lose weight. One requirement for the program is that you must hit at least 150 minutes of moderate to intense exercise. And remember, these are patients that may not have exercised one minute in the last month. The question that always comes up is, what does moderate to intense exercise mean? Is basketball intense where skiing is not? Is table tennis intense where golf is not? Of course not. It depends on the intensity. And here's how we defined it, just so we could be very clear. We define moderate intensity exercise as exercise where you can talk, but you can't sing. Let's bring that example back to studying. When you're truly actively learning, you should feel genuinely mentally tired. You're engaging with the material, spending time to truly grind through a question and condense a complex topic into very simple parts. It feels like hard work, because it is. When you have to make your own notes, you have to condense the information. You have to write the information in a way that makes sense to you. You know you're passively learning when your eyes are glazing across the textbook page or the lecture slide, and you're just nodding your head as to anything the professor says. The professor could say something completely outlandish, and all you would be doing is nodding your head. You know you're passively learning when your thoughts are drifting and you don't remember what you were doing five minutes ago. Now, of course, you can be extremely focused, but still passively learning. You can open up your textbook and be honed in on every sentence you read, but you're still passively learning. You're not engaging with the material. You're reading it, nodding your head, and accepting it to be truth. 
Active learning is when you're participating in your own learning process. You're playing with the material. You're condensing it. You're transforming it. You're doing something to the material other than just receiving it passively. Whether you're participating in your own learning, that's the difference between passive and active forms of learning. Okay, I wanna to go to a second subtopic, gathering information. Inherently, we know that some information is important and some isn't. Some things get tested and some don't. The bad news is that there's no app or magic tool that lets us know what's important and what's not. We have to figure that out for ourselves. Unless there's a way for you to peek at the test early, <laughs> and I certainly don't encourage that, there's no way for you to know what's on the test. The good news though, is that you can develop a skill to infer or guess what's going to be on that test. Ask yourself, based on the quizzes, homework assignments, and even previous tests that you've taken for this course, what showed up on those? Chances are those things are relevant. And when you're studying at home, make sure to continually ask yourself, is what I'm studying relevant? For example, is it important for me to recite the entire definition of the word sublimation, word for word, something like satisfying an impulse like anger in a socially acceptable way? Or did the test ask you to apply your knowledge in a more practical way? For example, would it be helpful for me to make up my own example of what sublimation is? Something like my mom tells me I can't buy the new PS5 and instead of being angry at her or something else, I channel that anger into swimming practice that afternoon and I hit a PR. What's more, I might even combine that information from other classes that I've taken. Sublimation in chemistry is turning a solid into a gas, one matter into another. Just like how I turn my anger for my mom into my excellence in swimming. That's how you get better at gathering information. You don't want to gather information in a vacuum. You want to gather information in a context informed by the quizzes, tests, and even upperclassmen that have taken the class before you. That's how you can know not only what is important, but how it's important, how it will be examined. So remember, not all information is created equal. Sometimes it's enough to learn the definition, but most of the time it's more important to be able to understand and apply the information to new contexts. Learn to be flexible and truly understand what you're studying. If all you can do is recite what's on the textbook, chances are you don't quite understand the topic. But of course, all this flexibility talk is only important if the thing you're studying is important at all. If the professor only mentioned sublimation one time in the last 10 lectures, chances are it's probably not that important. That other concept that the professor took seven slides to explain, that's probably important. Here's your third fundamental, organizing information in a way that makes sense to you. Remember, you're the person who has to eventually learn this. And so it can be useful the first time you see it to write notes for your future self. Not only do you create a chart, a highly active form of learning where you have to move bits and pieces of information here and here and here or wherever they'll fit, but then as an added bonus, you get a beautiful chart later when you're crunched for time and you just need to review quickly. That's a win on two fronts, the process of making a chart and the product of having a chart both promote good, strong, active learning. Here are examples of beautiful ways to organize your information. You can see that the top third organizes all the relevant enzymes in lipid transport. Anytime you need to study lipid transport, everything you need to know is there in one central location. The middle third has a wonderfully simple flow diagram with drawn pictures to help you remember any of the organs involved. It looks extremely simple, but with that foundation, you can now begin to pencil in the details one step at a time. Lastly, there's a great chart in the bottom. Instead of learning every protein in isolation, you have everything in one space and you can compare and contrast. Also, when everything's there, you can then see patterns that you might not have seen before if you didn't put it into a chart. I chose this page because it organized information in a variety of ways. You figure out what works for you. This could mean charts, flowcharts, Venn diagrams, anything that packages information in a way that you understand. The only way for you to know is to try everything and see what works best. Whenever I suggest this to students that I work with, they always say that they don't have enough time. Trust me, once you dial this in, you'll never have to figure it out again in your life. Figure it out now and studying for the rest of your life will be much, much more effective and much, much, much more easy. Let's move on to the next phase of studying well reviewing your information. Within information review, we'll talk about memorization. An important disclaimer, please. Before you memorize anything, 
ask yourself, do I understand it enough? The worst thing that you could ever do is start memorizing something before you truly understand it. If you start realizing that you're answering your flashcards based on the words around it, you haven't even read the full flashcard and you already know the answer, chances are you're just memorizing what the card looks like and not actually understanding the concept that the card is based on. When that happens, and it will, slow down. Figure out ways that you can get back to understanding the concept at hand and not just understanding how to memorize what's on a flashcard. Memorizing is useless because on the exam, I promise you, your flashcard and the exam will look completely different, even if they're testing the same concept. Whether it's different phrasing or if the professor does something silly like mirror the image, that's enough to throw you off, especially if you don't understand the concept. Another way to improve your memorization is if you link things that you don't know with things that you do know. It's like you're getting a buy one, get one free deal. Here's an example from anatomy, specifically the posterior mediastinum. There are three structures in that space that are near each other. It's the esophagus, the azagous vein, and the thoracic duct. The esophagus and the azagous vein are very clear. You can see them very clearly on a body, but sometimes people lose track of the thoracic duct. And so you can link the location of the thoracic duct, something that you don't know, based on the two locations of the things that you do know, the esophagus and the azagous vein. The thoracic duct, therefore, is in the middle of the two geese. And so that's how you link an unknown concept or word or location to two other concepts, words, or locations that you're more comfortable with. Another way to improve your memorization techniques is to include mnemonics. Here's a mnemonic that I use. The three stop codons are UAA, UGA, and UAG. UAA is you are annoying, UGA is you go away, and UAG is you are gone. And that's how you remember the stop codons. Okay. Let's move to the second pillar of reviewing your information, applying the information that you've learned. I mentioned earlier that practice questions or quizzes that were available were excellent ways for you to apply the knowledge that you learned. Today, I wanted to show you how I would go through a practice question or quiz. All right, so we have a question here from Functional Biology. Which of the following best describes the vital capacity of the lungs? Is it A, total lung capacity squared, B, equivalent to expiratory respiratory volume, C, Tidal volume minus total lung capacity, or D, total lung capacity minus residual volume. Most students would choose D, and most students are right. Fortunately, most students would have also just memorized the definition for vital capacity of the lungs. They would have had just some flashcard that said that vital capacity is equal to total lung capacity minus residual volume, and that's how they would have gotten the answer right. But on the test, when you're anxious and you're stressed and you're under a time pressure, and the question looks just a little different, chances are you'll get it wrong just because all you did was memorize a set of flashcards. I'll show you how I would go about understanding this concept. So yeah, while the answer is D, it's important for you to also understand why A, B, and C are wrong. But even more than that, scenarios where A, B, and C would be right. Or you could create a diagram like this one here, which breaks down every part of respiration from the tidal volume to the reserve volume to the fact that those two make inspiratory capacity to the other fact that if you add expiratory reserve volume to that then you get vital capacity it's just all on this one diagram here and everything becomes crystal clear once you're able to replicate it the last part in effectively reviewing your information is to teach it to other people go through key learning objectives you can usually find them at the beginning of PowerPoint presentations or even in the syllabus and teach one another from the absolute basics as if you were the professor explaining this to a five-year-old child. Here are the core learning objectives for one of my weeks at medical school. You can see how it's broken down into seven crucial concepts. And what my friends and I would do is go ahead and trade off. I teach number one to him and he'd teach me number two. And we'd go on and go all the way through to make sure that we both understood all of the core learning objectives, all of which were on the exam. All right, well, we talked about a lot today. We started with one of the most important concepts for any student to understand, active versus passive learning. Then we took a deep dive into learning how to gather information, 
organize information, review that information, and apply that information. Of course, learning to stress less by studying smarter to score higher is a hard thing to do. Otherwise, everyone would just be able to do it. The second half of this video is equally important as the first. In that half, we're gonna talk about learning environments. Should you study by yourself or in a group? Should you study at home or at a cafe? We'll also talk about the best practices for learning from lectures. Should you write or type your notes? Should you listen to the lecture live or review it on a podcast later? Then we'll get into some sexy neuroscience. We'll talk about Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve, a mathematical model for how quickly you forget things. After understanding that, we'll also understand how to avoid forgetting things. And lastly, we'll talk about test-induced anxiety, and I'll share what I have found to be successful and what I have learned from working from other students to be successful in combating test-induced anxiety. And that's the video. These are the most effective science-backed fundamentals of studying. I assure you, if you master these, you'll see instant results in less time. Please don't let this be one of those videos that you just watch and passively learn from. Do actively implement some of the things, just one thing that we talked about today. If you found the video helpful, please do help me out and hit that like button down below. If you'd like to see more from us, then please hit that subscribe button down below as well. If you'd like to be first to see those videos, please hit that bell notification as well. If you have any other questions, you can find my Instagram here please do send me a message. And if you are a local UCLA student, please do consider checking out our partner for the video, the Pre-Med Community Club at UCLA. Until then, stress less, study smarter, and earn higher grades. Take it easy. See you next time. Oh, shoot, you're still here? Well, thanks for watching to the end of the video. And second, I, I was just working on this quiz. It's this medical school chances calculator. Uh, you just take a 10 question quiz and at the end of it, you get your strengths, your weaknesses, and a customized school list. If you want to take it, here's the QR code. I mean, if that didn't work, um, here's a QR code as well. And then I'll also put the link in the description box below. Well, I'm going to go back to finishing the quiz, and I'll see you later.